You know, Mark opened his lesson last week by saying he wasn't going to talk about the weather. Well, I am. I, uh, I drove to Tulsa on Friday and said, you know, I'm going to get a break from this heat. It's a higher elevation. It's more to the east. No break. 103. Came back to Oklahoma City, 101. Said, well, I'll go to Dallas. I'll get a break there. Look what you people are doing to me. I'm melting away. Uh, I haven't quite, I've told my wife, you know, we didn't quite figure this out. In the summer, you're supposed to go north. We go south. Uh, We're in Proverbs uh, 23. We are in the sayings of the wise. Uh, the sayings of the wise are, were really found in the post-exilic temple. They, are, they were copies of wise sayings collected. And as a result, we have a lot of overlap from what we have already studied in the book of Proverbs. So... I've told you I'm going to skip through some of them because we have covered them, I think, extensively. Uh, We are in chapter 23, and the seventh saying of the wise, which is verse 1, 2, and 3 together. This is uh, such an interesting proverb, and I'm trying to think when I started it, how can I make this relevant to where we are? But it has a lot of practical ramifications. When you sit down with a ruler, consider what is before you. Place a knife to your throat if you're a glutton. Do not crave his delicious morsels. For that is deceptive food. What an interesting thought about wisdom and it's an instruction for skill to us. Here is the eighth wise saying, verse 4. Do not become weary to make yourself rich. Stop trusting in your own. You may have sight. It's really a... The word is translated insight. It really is about your own ability. And that is the idea of the word. Verse 5, when you let your eyes glance at riches, they are gone. That's an interesting word. We skip verses 6 through 8. Because it is just pretty much right in line with verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so we skip that and we go to the tenth wise saying, which is verse 9. In the ears of a fool do not speak. It's really a command here. For he will show contempt for your wise words. And then verses 10 and 11, we skip again because that is the widow's fatherless boundary stone that marked the properties, which we talked about in our last lesson. And then we come to the 12th wise saying, which is verse 12 itself. Apply your heart to instruction, your ears to words of knowledge. We skip 13 and 14, and then to 15, my son, if your heart is wise, my heart will be glad. And we'll finish there with that reminder of the importance of raising children in this book that teaches us how to raise children. So we begin with verses 1, 2, and 3. 
which comprise the seventh wise saying. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, mark well what is before you. Pay attention to what is going on. The most important word as I thought through this proverb is the word when. The very beginning, when you sit down. When is a reference to time, to place, to chronological order, to a setting. And so that's, in effect, what this is. It's a setting. It's a place. We say, when I first met you. What do we do when we say that? Our minds immediately go back to a time, a place, a setting, and that's what you have here. So what is it? It's you sit down to eat with a ruler. The statement assumes that you have that type of a relationship with a king or a high-profiled person that provides, or God provides, such a providence like that. I go and study at a place, coffee shop, early in the morning. I go there because it opens earlier than all other places, and it's usually very quiet. About three years ago, the former governor came back from Washington, and now he meets once a week, puts tables together, and he has his old cabinet there in the center of this restaurant, and he kind of, he kind of uh, is the chairman of the board and rules the, the table. And they're always discussing some issues, and it's pretty interesting. Well, I'm going to surprise you, but not one time, not once, has that governor ever said, you know, hey, you study all the time. Why don't you come over here and sit down next to me? And uh, we'd really like your thoughts on Cambodia or uh, abortion or whatever it is. That's never happened. I'm still waiting. Look at line two. Mark well. Pay attention. Discern. Perceive. This is what wisdom offers to us. We got that Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, teaching discernment, teaching perception. And here's what it's for, what is before you. That's kind of ambiguous. Is it the food? Is it the ruler? Is it the setting itself? Now, the, the second line tends to focus us on the food itself, and that is probably, if you put a pie chart together and you colored it, that would probably be uh, 70 or 80 percent of the idea. But I think it also is the when, the setting, the ambiance, what's going really on here. I have learned in my life that sometimes people put you in a setting, take you to a place because they want to show you how important they are. Uh, and it's there to intimidate you. It's there to quietly instruct you. They don't have to say a word. You just find out, look, I'm really a really pretty important person. Do you understand that? And they never have to open their mouth to say a word. I think that's a part of what's going on here. So, even though there's no mention of the ruler any further, line two clarifies that a big portion of this is food, and here's why. There weren't McDonald's back in the ancient Near East. Uh, you really had to be careful when you ate, where you ate, how you ate, because uh, your food was not just accommodating. You couldn't just run to the local store and get your groceries. Uh, that's part of this setting. 
that's going on here. It's really, uh, a proverb is tending to direct us to a power play, if you will. And uh, look at this word before. It's very interesting. What does it mean? Well, I looked it up. It's uh, found in a very interesting place, Genesis 18.22. It's uh, used of Abram's intercessory prayer. He was standing before the Lord, asking him about the salvation of the numbers in Sodom. It's the first intercessory prayer in all the Bible, praying for someone else, a third party. So wisdom is teaching us to know that Whatever is before us, it's there for a reason. And that's where we mark or perceive or discern what's going on. This image that's used is uh, very vivid. Look at this. Place a knife at your throat if you're a glutton. Uh, better to slice your own throat than to get indulged. That's the idea. Um, put in place is an exaggeration. Uh, that's not unusual in the scriptures. Um, our Lord in Matthew chapter 5 talks about plucking out your eye, cutting off your hand. That's all exaggeration to illustrate the need for personal righteousness. It's an exaggeration that makes a point. And that's what's happening here. The dagger, same word that's used of Abram going with his son, Genesis 22, to sacrifice. And if is the conduct. If and when you're given to gluttony, overeating, if you just find that your heart is a screen door in a submarine with all this ambiance going on don't get involved don't be like that that's the skill that's being taught it's telling us that there's no relaxation for the righteous in such a, a form and don't be involved in self-indulgence look at this word crave don't crave for it's deceptive food. It's a deceptive setting. And here's your perfect illustration for what's going on from the Bible in this proverb. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and took the southern kingdom away into captivity, uh, he went out and gathered up outstanding young Jews. Jewish boys, and they had to go through a certain rigor in order to be selected. And then he marched them off to Babylon. Now, these young men, their manhood was taken from them, their families were taken from them, their language was taken from them, their culture, their names, they stripped them of everything. They were going to make sophisticated Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar wanted the best of the best of everybody he conquered. One of those people was Daniel. Now, Daniel, chapter 1 and verse 8, he determined there is one thing that I can control and that's what I eat. And I'm going to be faithful to God in the one thing that I can control, because you see, Nebuchadnezzar, he provided for them this splendid buffet, the best of Babylon for the best of his young men. But Daniel determined not to defile himself, think about that, defile by a table. See, he's going to keep to the law and he did that and God gave him favor and 
put people around him that provided for him to do that. And so he didn't eat of the royal banquet. He was a man in control of the small thing that he could control. And that is his faithfulness to God by what he ate. And God blessed him for doing that. Now, he's the perfect contrast in the proverb to the, to the man who is uh, given over to indulgence. Uh, this word morsels uh, occurs six times outside our chapter right here. And what's interesting is of the six times it is used, it is used only in one place. Six times in one place outside this chapter. That was Genesis chapter 27 where... Isaac, in his old age, had become somewhat of a glutton. Genesis 27, 4, he tells his unregenerate son Esau, now go kill some game and put together, your text reads, savory food. That's our word, savory food. Proverbs 23, 3, delicious morsels. Hence, the proverb Isaac had given himself to indulgence and he was willing to forget the will of God which was the blessing to go to Jacob and he was going to give it to Esau. More about that in a moment. Look at line 3, 4. That is going to explain and to finish what is deceptive food or Deceptive setting. It's all a mirage. It's a bunch of lies. See, what you find out is this is just a test. And it's a test probably for you and me in the providence of God. So what's the proverb saying? When dealing with an authority or one that wants to educate you that they are an authority, the skill is... To be a person that keeps their wits about them doesn't get involved in what they're seeing. And that's the proverb. That's the food and the ambiance of lives. Be like Daniel. Keep your heart guarded. For that is the issue of life here. Here is verse 4 and 5, which is saying number 8. Do not become weary to make yourself rich. Stop trusting your own insight, wisdom, ability. This is a saying that has an immediate tension to it. Because you see, all through the Proverbs, they have been teaching us over and over that hard discipline work produces wealth, honor, and benefits. It comes to those who put in the effort, the long, hard effort in the book of Proverbs. Work is, in Reformed theology, the means to the end. And in Reformed theology, means is as important as the end result. So, the imperatives of the proverb lead us to diligence. Hard work, that was the ant. Proverbs 6, that's the tension. Now, let's solve it. Line 1, we open again with a negative pattern we've seen so often, do not. And we have, in, as in the past, the word become. That's an important word in Bible study. Become. It's not one. It's not two. Become is what's between one and two. See, you are transitioning to something. That's the word. And theologically, it reminds us 
what the book of Proverbs has been teaching all along. That you are never in neutral. You are always transitioning from the fool to the hardened mocker. Or from the wise to even greater wisdom. We are always becoming something. Never in neutral. This advancement is advancement in the wrong way. And look at this word weary. That's bodily fatigue through labor. To make for yourself or to acquire. The prohibition then is fatigue and exertion on the wrong thing. I wonder how many people at the end of their lives say, I spent so much time, energy, and effort on the wrong thing. Well, here's your proverb to tell you not to do that. Now, I think in order to get a proper perspective on this proverb, I, we need to do some thinking outside the proverb itself. Uh, and I thought a good place for us to start was from our beginning, regeneration. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 1.26. You don't need to turn there. It's a passage you're probably very familiar with. The Apostle Paul said, consider your calling. So let's spend a moment considering it. He said, think of what you were when, there's our word, See, setting, place, time. This is a way to study the Bible. Think of it transitioning from one room into the next. When? That's the setting. Think of what you were when you were called. Okay? This is our time of regeneration. Back to the beginning. Not many wise by human standard. Not many influential. Not many noble no, in reality, he says, basically, we were all fools. Now, some were very wealthy fools. Some were very accomplished fools at that time. But nevertheless, they were fools. Now, here's the perspective. When I look at the Apostle Paul, I go back to his beginnings. Consider your beginnings. Okay, so here is Saul of Tarsus going down that Damascus road on his way to either arrest or kill Christians. And what I find so interesting is I see the same personality in this man, Saul of Tarsus, that I find decades later in Paul the Apostle. Here's what I mean by that. In Philippians chapter 3, he describes his prior life. Saul of Tarsus, Damascus Road. He said that he passed all of his Pharisee brothers, his mates in the class. He was a Pharisee among them all. He was zealous. He was a driven man. That's the way he described himself. What I find interesting is decades later, this man, Paul, has the same temperament. 1 Corinthians 15.10, he says, regarding the apostles, I outworked them all. He's the same kind of guy. But here's the difference. And this, I think, will provide the insight into the proverb. Same personality. But the aim of his life is completely different. That's the big change. And here's the way he explains it to us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, It's no longer I. It's no longer Saul of Tarsus. It's no longer Paul the Apostle. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8 he says, you put all my accomplishments in a big box and just burn it. Throw it away. It's meaningless compared to knowing Christ. Look at the change, but the same drive, the same personality. Then he tells us something that I remind myself all the time. 
1 Corinthians 11, 1. Follow me as I follow Christ. So that's what I need to do. I need to make my advancements the same way the apostle does. And so here's my aim. To be effective in my life. And to not weary myself on what is transitory, empty, ephemeral, and doesn't last. Paul was in for something that lasts and was substance. Not the shadow, but the real thing. Now here's an insight from wisdom. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 7. Solomon gives us a very interesting perspective on the creation here. He says, all man's efforts are for his own mouth, for his own well-being. But his appetite, he says, is never satisfied. Now, I want to take that back to our proverb. Don't wear yourself out. Because here's what I think he's alluding to. Go back to the beginnings. The woman in the garden. She looked at the tree. She looked at the fruit. And what did she say? She said, it looked good for food. What good for food? My goodness gracious, she had all the food in the world that she knew. But you see, that's what the enemy does. He gets you to focus down on one thing. And here is the turbulence that he creates in your mind. He says, you're missing something. You see, there's something else on the other side of that curtain that you don't have. And that was the lie. And she bought it. And when she bought it, you and I bought it. That is the creation in futility. And what is it? I need something just a little more. Just a little more. Uh, It's not a million. Now I need a billion. And I don't need one. I need two, three, five, ten. It's not this car. It's a better car. Next year's car. We're about to enter NFL training camps. And we're going to see these organizations in these cities spend multi-millions of dollars to the end result that in February, somebody can take that silver Lombardi trophy and hold it up in the air. And the moment that we bring it down, Every fan is going to say the same thing. we got to do this again. (laughs) Why? Because that's the futility of life. That's the creation. That's what we're being warned against. Just know that this world is designed to wear you out. That's what it's there for. Have the discipline the skill for living, to put life in the proper perspective. That's what our Lord Jesus taught us. Matthew 6.33, here it is. Seek the kingdom first, foremost. Wear yourself out to it. That was Paul. And then all these other things will be given to you. You see, look at this second imperative in the proverb stop meaning refrain it's the same proverb the same word in the proverb 10 19 second line reads whoever restrains his lips is prudent that's our word it it means to stop to withdraw from a particular activity okay what's the activity look at your proverb trusting that's a uh, few weeks back, that was, the, uh, that was the bridge, that extension bridge that bent way over the gulch that I was trying to encourage my friend Alan to go across with me. 
Trust it. It's reliable. What's interesting about the word, trust the Lord with all your heart, same word, is that oftentimes, most oftentimes, the word is reliable. It's a negative in the Old Testament. You rely on false prophets. You rely on your own strength. You rely on your own ability. What's the proverb saying? Stop it. Don't do that. And there it is. Insight. Sight. The words in the negative employing mental abilities without trusting God. Typical behavior of people that don't trust God. You see, you're so gifted. You're so talented. Things are easy for you. And that's where you get into trouble. Lot is your example. Oh, he's no dummy. Abram gave him the choice, and what did he do? He looked down at the well-watered plain towards Sodom, and he said, look, huh. man, this is a no-brainer. And he craved it. That's the word in the proverb. Charles Bridges said, he who sought the world lost it all, but he who sought the Lord first got them both. Heaven and the earth were the meek inherit. Just look how deceptive the world is. Verse 5, you let your eyes glance at riches. You know, let me define riches for you. You've signed all your contracts. You've got a desk book. Now your, your funds are wired into your account and you have already gotten together with your CPA and you have paid your taxes. There it is. It's all there now. Net, net to you. What are you going to do? Well, if you set your heart on it, you say, well, now I'm going to start living. Now I'm going to start being something that you have never been before. That's foolish behavior. Here's why. You cast a glance. Literally, the word is for the image of a bird. God-given movements. Their eyes are so quick. And... Uh, our instruction is for children not to set their heart and affections upon this world. So, what do we do? We say, well, I'll go do this. I'll go do that. You know who said that? You know who said that in the Bible? I'll just go do this. I'll just go do that. Samson. Look it up. Judges 16.30, Delilah cut his hair, and he said, well, I'll just go out as before. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. You see, you're either in the will of God or you're not. And he had no power outside the will of God, just like you and I don't as well. He's, this is Rebecca. Back in Genesis 27, same story. You know, she's going to make that stew for her blind husband Isaac. Putting that fur on Jacob. Well, I'll show him. I'll just do the same thing that I always do. I can fool him. And it all worked. Every bit of it worked. Perfect. But it was short-lived, wasn't it? Because... She went on her own initiative, not trusting God, and the providence of God came back to bite her. Esau said, I'm going to kill Jacob. And she has to get him out of the house. Her beloved Jacob, who she had all these plans for. Oh, to see my boy grow up and be. And... Uh, 
It was because of her activity. She will never see him again. I uh, was teaching that to a group of men. I had a guy come up to me and said, you hit me right between the eyes with that story. Because you see, as a result of my business affairs, I went to Leavenworth. And I had to take my beloved son and be away from him. And he said, now I'm desperate to try to get that time back. Oh, the scriptures are clear. Look at this top line. It says, take a glance at riches. Look on, look for mammon, wealth. Those, these words are added to smooth out the broken Hebrew. I'm, let me give this to you because it's a wonderful picture. The words, if you do then, that's supplied. That's not in the inspired text. But here is the inspired text, it's one word, one word. You, you cast a glance, and here's the word, gone. Gone. Two emphatic proverbs, proverbs uh, emphatic uh, words here. Certainly, surely, here now is our figure. They'll make themselves wings. That's the figure. And like is a comparison. A mark of agreement. And they'll fly. You take one glance. You believe in it. You think you're different by it. And it's all gone. All that you work for is gone. In a temporary world that deceives. Because that's what it's designed for. We're skipping... Verses 6 through 8, and we're coming to 9. In the ears of a fool, do not speak. For, because he will show contempt for your prudent words. The top line opens in the ears. The ear, like the eyes, is the gateway to the heart. It controls your decisions. And look at these three words. Declare that wisdom was delivered. Emphatically, urgently. How? Look at the word speaking. Yet no response. Shouldn't surprise us. One of our first presuppositions in theology is that unbelievers, here the fools, cannot receive the revelation of the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14. It's one of the basis of our thinking about theology. The natural man cannot, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him, and he will not be able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Does not, cannot. Cornelius Van Til, the great theological thinker, philosopher, theologian, he illustrated it this way. I think it's very vivid. He says, you take the unregenerate man, and he's so smart, he can think circles around you. And his brain is a power saw. And so he's going to build a house. Whoop, 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 cuts all his lumber. Here's me. I'm over here. I got a saw. He's got his lumber all stacked. He starts building his house. I'm still cutting my wood. But Van Til says, this is what you learn about the unregenerate mind. That's so quick, that's so powerful, that's so fast. The blade is never straight. You see, that's his presupposition. It's always cut at an angle. So when he cuts his boards, he cuts them fast. But... He always cuts them at an angle. So when it comes time for him to build his house, it's very unstable because his boards aren't straight. Now I'm over here, and I finally get my boards all stacked, and I build my house, 
it's not much, but my boards are straight. You see, that's what the revelation of God produces in your mind. You think clearly. You think straightly. And as a result, you're ahead. You don't think you are. You always think you're behind. Look at this command. Top line, do not speak. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy on the fool. Don't pour out your wisdom on him. And now the explanation. Because or for, he'll show contempt. Your translation may read despised. You see, it's antithetical to his mind. Here is the Lord Jesus, and he confronts the chief priests and the teachers of the law with a canon. And here's how he does it. John 5, 40. You will not come to me that you can have life. Here it is. I'm offering it, and you won't come because you don't understand. Men his minds are messed up. It's called the noetic, N-O-E-T-I-C, noetic effects of sin. The gospel's a haze to them. They, they think that the world all works with boards cut at an angle. And it doesn't. What does Peter tell us, practically speaking? 1 Peter 3.15, give an answer that presupposes you're asked. Understand who you're speaking to, when you're speaking. What I have found in my 50 years of walking with the Lord, that to my surprise, I am really preaching the gospel in a lot of ways without words. And I'll end with this illustration. Back to my place that I go early in the morning. Well, there's a group of retired guys, four or five of them. And, uh, and they, they, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they meet. 7 a.m. And it's always the same topic. Sports, sports, sports. The world rotates on sports. That's all they talk about. And uh, I'll be in line right next to them, and I know a few of them personally, and they may speak to me and ask me for a question or something. And this one individual, this dentist who's retired, he has done this now several times. He goes, okay, okay. Get back over and read your Bible. And, oh, that's the, fun, that's the funniest thing they've ever heard. They just love it. So you can imagine how surprised I was in January or February. I'm reading my Bible, right? And suddenly this body slides in the booth across from me. I look up and it's the dentist. And he says to me, I just want to let you know what's going on. Okay. It's about my heart, he said. And he begins to tell me his issues. He didn't want a dialogue. He didn't want comments. He just wanted to talk. Now, do I look like I have doctor on my forehead? <laughs> Do I look like I own some medical facility? I'm the dummy over here reading my Bible. But what he said became loud and clear. He was scared. And he found a person for some reason. Who knows what goes on in the unregenerate mind? that he felt comfortable talking to. My friends, you are preaching the gospel. Sometimes you can use words. But believe me, 
the life of wisdom that we're studying, the book of Proverbs, makes you powerful. Because you have what they don't. And they see it. And they know it. So walk in it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. How grateful we are to be able to open the Scriptures and they come alive to us right where we are, right in this setting, when today so relevant. Lord, we are devoid of ourselves the skill, but you give it, and you give it abundantly. And so we ask, as James tells us, for that skill, wisdom, to live our lives effectively to your honor and glory. And it is to that end that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.